Good everyone. As I mentioned a moment ago, we have uh, a full morning with so much good to do together that I want to start um, very nearly right on time. But we'll start with some of the opening proceedings that you only have to half listen to, uh, my part at least. And, and so if you're still uh, finding your spot and getting your food, um, feel free to um, do that as, as we continue to welcome you. Good morning. We're so happy that you're here. And uh, with us, as we conclude our third year of the Pilgrim Forum, this is our sixth offering. Uh, if it seems to you that it's flown by, it seems that way to us as well. I'm Julie Massey, Associate Vice President for Mission and Student Affairs. And along with President Tom Kunkel, with Father Jay Fosner, our Vice President for Mission and Student Affairs, I'm very happy to welcome you to what promises to be a terrific morning together. Many of you have been with us uh, on occasion or, or all through the series, and so you can see from our setup that today is a bit of a departure in form. We are at the midpoint in the exploration of the creed. As you might realize, the creed is on the back of the program, and um, we've made it through, uh, was crucified, died, and was buried, was our last session with Dr. Mara Brecht. And so at this point, as we're more or less partway through the creed, we decided to take a pause to move into a more deliberate opportunity for sustained conversation. Some of you sent us questions ahead of time, and we've worked to group those into a starter set that our panel will be looking at. But there is also paper and some pens at your table. Some of you guessed correctly that that's uh, something there that you can use to write down questions. And so as we move through, especially at the beginning time here, if you have questions you're interested in the panel addressing, I invite you to write those out and, and just kind of lift a hand. And one of the two Julies, myself or Julie Friedman in the back, will come around to collect it. Our aim is to try to group your questions so that the panel might be able to look at as many po as possible. And our trusty moderator will help you uh, help us move through those as we can. Before we get further into our proceedings, uh, it's my pleasure to bring up Deacon Kevin DeClean, our Senior Director of Parish Services, to offer a prayer. Thank you, Julie. Please bow your heads as we ask for God's blessing. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the gift of the people of St. Norbert College. We are here as we acknowledge that our unity in faith needs to be nourished and deepened. Through our prayer, Norbertine values, our work and study together, may unity among us come more perfect. And we ask this in the name of our Creator. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. As many here know, this series was started through the vision and support of Dr. Dan Ritter to contribute to the public conversation on core beliefs in our faith. Dr. Ritter, his beautiful wife, his daughter, and son are with us this morning, and Dan offered to share a few thoughts before we begin. So I'd invite you up, Dan. Do you prefer to speak from here or with a microphone? Okay, come on up. Well, it's not raining cats and dogs, but... <laughs> It's still the Pilgrim Forum. Uh, this, is the, this is the microphone. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to frighten you a little bit at the beginning here. <clears throat> Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. I have to do that in order to make sure I can speak loud enough to reach you all. <laughs> so I, I try it anyway. That's what, my, that's what my fitness instructor tells me. Uh, uh, you know, anthropologists, uh, I'm told, refer to most of us as uh, homo sapiens or sapiens or whatever, and uh, meaning men and women who think or know or do trying to know something. That will be distinguish us from the Hottentots or the Neanderthals. But uh, I prefer to think of us as people who always want to know. We always insist upon knowing. We are never content. We're always searching for the truth. And uh, 
I think that may be our, our, a great virtue and also a real problem. And that's why many of us are here. We're still searching. We're always in the process of searching. That's why we're the pilgrims, actually looking for the truth all the time. Uh, <clears throat> as, a, uh, as a graduate of a grammar school down in Evanston, Illinois, the grammar school was named St. Athanasius. I don't know if all of you know who St. Athanasius was, but those of us at the school did know. And he was probably the, uh, one of the founders of our church. <laughs> and uh, he was at the Nicene Creed, uh, or at the Nicaea, Creed of Nicaea, where they determined on much of the doctrine that we've held for the last 2,000 years. Uh, in fact, they were such a, 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 a they were always arguing as they, as maybe we are still today. And the Emperor Constantine just about sent them all home. He got tired of hearing all, all the all the arguments about what's the right thing, what is the truth. And uh, I sometimes wonder if maybe we're not headed in that same direction again. Because there is an awful lot of talk of what's going on in our church. Uh, and uh, in, in large measure, because of that Creed of Nicaea, the Nicaean Creed that we do say every church, every every Sunday at church, or they, they call it the Apostles' Creed. I don't know why, why they call it the Apostles' Creed, but anyway, we say we say the the things we 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 go through the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. And but doggone it, there are people who wonder, what's is this really our creed? What, what are we believing in? What are we doing here? Uh, my daughter gave me a, a book a couple of months ago, this book, uh, Spiritual and Religious Explorations of the Seeker. I don't know if any of you read it. It's a rather uh, advanced book. I'm, I was totally caught totally unaware. <laughs> I, mean, I, I wonder about her. Her, uh, if she's really, if she's really, if she's 100% fledged in, in where she was supposed to be. But I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, read a, a, a brief uh, excerpt from this, and uh, that's that's really one reason why I thought I'd talk about about this a little bit. So I'm quoting from, uh, and this is from. Roger Haight, that's, he's the, he's the author, and he's got S.J. after his name. <clears throat> As you all know, that would mean Society of Jesus. And this was, <clears throat> I'm going to stumble around a little bit. This was published by Orbis Books. He's Marinol. <laughs> and uh, I, I have this kind of a recollection. I was 30 years ago, more or less from today, I was a, I was in a dungeon drilled into the mountains down in Panama and uh, and it was I was at the uh, headquarters of US Southcom and we were studying not this particular guy but he was at the same same kind of part where he's from he's from what they call liberation theology I don't know if any of you have heard too much about liberation. I don't think you hear about it too much here. Down in Latin America, you heard about it a lot at that particular point in time. And that was a time when <clears throat> our government was very much involved uh, in, in, a, in a situation down there. And that was with the Sandinistas. And uh, it was in Nicaragua, but I was in Panama. But I was there, at, as I said, at the U.S. Southcom, headquarters U.S. Southcom. And they have a tunnel drilled into the mountains down there. And of course, it's got about four or five chair or doors you gotta break your way into. And uh, we're trying to figure out what to do about how to confront this issue. And, uh, and the commander at, at Southcom wanted to know whether we, we had the Pope was coming down there to visit. And he had just been kind of shunned by Ortega, who was the president. And uh, how we, how, what is our policy going to be regarding this, this movement, this, uh, this uh, 
uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, theological, uh, uh, what did they call them a moment ago? Uh, liberation theology. And uh, so I kind of came up finally with it, well, we ought to kind of side with the Pope. And, uh, and we did. But uh, it, was, it was interesting. Well, anyway, I'm going to read this, this excerpt that I've got here. And this is kind of what we're, we're going to be facing, I think, as the, as the years go on. So the quote is, <clears throat> One of the main reasons for the failure of the doctrine of Trinity this almost blows your mind, the failure of the doctrine of Trinity today. And that, if, and that is that is that few people understand it. My gosh, you know, and I, I, I thought this is a little frightening. Of course, no one understands God. And are we entering into this period of time? If we are, the church needs us. <laughs> Uh, very, very badly. Uh, <clears throat> you know, for centuries we've, we've been comfortable. We've just kind of flowed along. And we do the same thing every Sunday. We repeat the creed. And we're very comfortable in our, in our faith. But I think we're going to be entering into some, some rough, rough years ahead. And so we are, I think, I think at the forefront of that. And we're going to reconsider what we're doing here. I think we should have to stay stay faithful and stay with it. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. You know, it's strange. I had to have my, my daughter. I wrote this thing out first, but I couldn't read my writing. So, <laughs> so she came last night and she rewrote it for me. I can't read her spelling. So, so anyway, um, uh, I hope that we will pro provide you with a lot of, a lot of uh, food for thought in these f future weeks that we meet, and that we remain faithful to our church. <laughs> and uh, with that, with that, that's really about all I have. That, uh, and uh, I, we, I don't have we don't have these for sale, but this is the book, uh, and uh, so please keep the the future in mind as we move forward, and uh, we have to uh, have to be flexible, I think, uh, as we do this, and not get uh, up at each other's throats of oh you're you're a, you're a heathen you're you're pre you're preaching something we're not ready to do. No, we this church is. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That, that's enough for me. By the way, I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh. Well, you're, only your wife can say that to you, but I do, I do want to, I do want to um, acknowledge again with gratitude uh, the the vision and the support of Dr. Dan Ritter, and you can hear the passion behind his commitment to this series that we continue to think about and engage what we believe and not just sort of passively go through the motions of, of living out what we believe. Well, now with no further ado, let's begin. It's a, a, a reminder again, if you have questions and hold them up, one of the two Julies will run around. Uh, we'll try to keep our eye out for you. But it's my pleasure now to turn things over to Tom Kunkel, president of St. Norbert College. As most of you realize, Tom is in the waning days of his nine years as our college president, and he is leaving this community even better than he found it in so very many ways. We are grateful for his leadership of our college and delighted he agreed to facilitate this morning's conversation. Tom. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everybody. Um, and I, I'm really happy to see you here on this beautiful um, Eastertide morning. And uh, before we start, just very, very quickly, I, we're so thrilled to have Dan and his family here because they've been down in Florida and we actually didn't think until a few weeks ago that they would be with us uh, today as much as Dan tries to make as many of these as possible, but um, circumstances got them back early. 
So we're thrilled, and Dan, thank you. It, one of the joys of my job has been, over these almost decade, is to get to know uh, and come into the orbit of people like Dan Ritter. Uh, many times I think people think about colleges and they think it's a place where people go for answers. Uh, Dan's an educator, so he knows what we know, and that, that is a college is mostly a, bit, a place for questions. Uh, sometimes you get answers, and sometimes you think you get answers. And sometimes you have answers that later in life you realize weren't answers at all. But we never stop asking questions. We are all seekers. And um, the idea for this forum, which was Dan's, was so exciting to us. And every conversation we have along the way um, is just a, a really terrific uh, intellectual discourse. So Dan, thank you. And uh, we just really, really appreciate, as Julie said, your passion, but also your commitment to our faith and to the college. Uh, we have a wonderful panel for you this morning. It's going to be pretty freewheeling. Uh, as Julie said, um, please pull your own questions together. We've got some you've already sent when we asked you the last time. Uh, our speakers' bios are in your <clears throat> material, so I'll just be very quick and say, uh, ladies first, Dr. Bridget burke Visa, Associate Professor of Theology and Religious Studies. Uh, Bridget's research focuses on sexual ethics and the ethics of marriage and family. She's widely published, and that includes a book that came out two years ago that she wrote in partnership with our own Julie Massey, entitled Project Holiness, Marriage as a Workshop for Everyday Saints. Bridget obtained degrees from Santa Clara University and University of San Diego before getting her PhD from Boston College. To her right is Father Andrew Saferni, O-Prem. Andrew is the director of the Center for Norbertine Studies here. He is actually on loan to us from his Norbertine community at Dalesford out in Pennsylvania. But he's a 64 graduate of St. Norbert, and he holds a licentious in sacred theology from Gregorian University in Rome and a PhD in liturgical studies from Notre Dame. He speaks or comprehends half a dozen languages at least. He is an expert in Norbertine history, and he has been a joyfully active member of the campus community, including serving on the College of Chaplains that ministers to our own parish here at Old St. Joe's. And finally, to my immediate right is Dr. Paul Waddell. Paul is a professor of theology and religious studies. He is a leading American theologian who came to St. Norbert College almost 20 years ago now. His main areas of interest are Christian ethics and the theology of the church. He has made a special study of the virtues of friendship in Christian life, especially as they are presented in the theology of Thomas Aquinas. A proud native of Louisville, Kentucky, and, and because he's from Louisville, he knows it's pronounced Louisville, two syllables. <laughs> uh, Paul graduated from Bellarmine College there before getting several master's degrees at Catholic Theological Union and his PhD from Notre Dame. So uh, you're in very good hands, uh, your moderator notwithstanding this morning. Paul, since, since this whole um, series has been orga organized around the creed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you because you sent me a note um, that said, and I'm just going to quote the first line or two from it, it occurs to me that um, it might be best to think of, of how it might be best to think of the creed. Instead of seeing it primarily as a list of propositions or a checklist of beliefs, uh, I think of the creed as an abridged version of God's story of salvation. I wonder if you could maybe take a minute and, and expand or articulate a little bit about what you're thinking about. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I think what's, you know, we recite the creed every Sunday uh, at the Eucharist, but I, I see that really as a kind of shortened story of God's love for us, because if you look at the creed overall, uh, it's more about God seeking a relationship with us. I think the creed is a story that tells us that God loves us and wants our good. And to me, that's a really a cornerstone of our faith, that God is not indifferent to us, but God loves us and wants our good. So the creed begins with the act of creation, uh, which is an expression of God's generosity, uh, God's goodness. Uh, it continues wherein God sends Jesus. Uh, and I think of Jesus as the gift of God's friendship in person. And then continues with the gift of the Spirit and the church and the creed ends with the promise of the forgiveness of sins and the everlasting life. And if you think of that, of the whole arc of the story of the creed, I think it, it reinforces the idea that God, God is for us. Uh, it's a story of God's uh, creative and redemptive love. 
But the other side of that, I think it's a story. It's uh, it's a story that we're called to live. So I don't think we're really we're not so much called to recite the creed, but to embody it, uh, to live the creed. So that if 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 God loves us creatively and redemptively and mercifully, then I think the mission of of the church is to be the kind of community that does that in the world. Um, to see the creed really as, as the call to a particular way of life, uh, rooted in gratitude. You know, if God loves us, is merciful to us, and seeks our good, then we're called, I think, to be that kind of people in the world. So I, I see the creed really as something to celebrate and be grateful for, and not so much uh, as a kind of checklist of, of beliefs. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Bridget, kind of following up on that notion of the creed is not a a carved in stone document, maybe so much as an organic, um, an organic thing. Um, you know, our faith life is a living thing. Um, it's not just you know with what one was raised with or or learned in catechism. Um, as theological scholars, um, does your own faith evolve in light of of what you teach or your your educational experiences, your personal experiences, or does it evolve in light of what's happening in the the, uh, the more formal church? I mean, you know, it, it's an elastic uh, faith life, I imagine. Uh, I would say it definitely develops over the course of, um, of life, over our experiences, and in through our friendships even, and and our marriages, I mean, I think about that a lot in my, in my own work, but I think even about how my faith has developed in and through teaching. And as students ask new questions, I think I read more and learn more and seeking to respond to those kinds of questions, but also I think what's happening in the wider society, so thinking about um, for example, in my teaching, more recently, I've, I've thought more centrally about questions around race, because I think we need to think about those things uh, theologically, and or thinking about questions about ecological justice, for example, uh, more and more in the forefront. And, and so if we're, as Paul says, living our faith, applying our faith on a day-to-day -day basis than everything that we encounter, our relationships, um, what's happening in the wider world needs to be theologically considered. Just to follow that a little bit, so, you know, to know where you are, there needs to be a true north. And let's say true north is, you know, your, your true core faith. How, you know, how do you um, navigate, you know, the things that life throws at you and, and yet Con continue to to you know uh, div you know lead your life with true north in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, f for me, and I think this is I share this uh, with with Paul in terms of thinking about ethics. It's it's not necessarily um, some set of rules, although rules can be important. But it's more about virtues and um, these core values that we that we strive for as as Christians, and so I think if, if I can keep those as, as guides of where, where I'm moving, I mean, ultimately it's toward holiness, but I think about holiness as being the virtuous life, living in right relationship with God and with others, and so it's not, as, as you noted, it's, it's different than catechism. It's not necessarily having some set of answers, but it's somehow searching toward how, how do I respond to everything that I encounter during the day in a way that's going to bring me, um, that's going to make me holier, that's going to bring, make me better. I don't know if that answers mm -hmm. the question. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, uh, kind of uh, referencing back a little bit to what uh, Dan was talking about a while ago, I mean, obviously throughout history there, there have been challenges to, to being a believer. Um, and maybe the, the challenges change depending on the circumstances that, that one finds oneself in. What, what are the challenges, uh, you know, to being a, a believer today? You know, we are in a, we're in the 21st century. We're in a very uh, fast, 
global but secular and materialistic world. Um, more people are probably aware about the, the life and teachings of, of Jesus Christ, but maybe more people question their relationship. Uh, what, what's, the, what's, the, um, what's your sense of the challenges of, of living a faith life today? Well, uh, my guess would be, uh, taking it uh, from my students, that uh, probably one of the biggest challenges is the church itself, is uh, what, what is the... What is the meaning of, of, of being in the church? Now, there's a real longing for community. And uh, it's interesting because the, the, the course I teach is basically about communio and trying to get under the skin of it as we tend to understand it here. But, but several of them said in their most recent uh, paper, I realize that, that what we are getting is a language, a name, for something that we have been experiencing. And they talk about, in particular, about the culture of the college, that, that, that we have this experience. But I think that there's a disconnect when they try to, to experience that in the church. Now, I think that can be from, I think that comes from a lot of different vectors. One of them is that, in fact, there has been, I think, since the council, a, a really, a real decline in the quality of religious formation of, of young people. So, I, I mean, they come with, with an incredible ignorance. And not, not, just of the, not just of the church. So, for example, like when I'm trying to do something uh, on the history of the order and put it in a historical context, I, mean, I said to them one day, do you think Charlemagne was a basketball player? I mean, it's, it's like, uh, it, it, it's, it's, you know, the, so, so I think that, that, that that's part of it, but, but I think that I mean, worship is my area. I think that, that oftentimes the language of worship, the way it is uh, preaching, is not, is not connecting. But, but the other is, is just the way that, that, that because of the, of the lack of, of, first of all, religious formation, and I mean that both on the le level of, of information, but also the lack of a spirituality. I think, I think the, the decline of, of spiritual formation is, is, and that gets to both the question that gets to both the question of Trinity and, and of community. I think that that is, uh, I mean, for, for myself, I think when like, the question that you asked for Bridget, I am I move more and more into the contemplative tradition. I think that that addresses both systematic theology, it addresses virtue and ethics, and I think these are all challenges in in the world today. How much of that, just stay with that a minute, how, I think what you articulated, we all feel and appreciate. How much of that do you think is just this, this overwhelming popular culture, you know, which is now on steroids with the internet and multimedia? Um, and, and how much of it is, do you think, is a generational failing or um, just mm -hmm. a general slipping in terms of uh, uh, you know, well, our, our practice mm -hmm. of the faith or our passion for the faith or whatever. Well, I, you know, I, I think I might connect it to your, uh, to your presentation here last evening, uh, uh, or at Michael's. The, uh, Tom did the presentation for the Academic Awards uh, dinner, and he was talking about uh, just the nature of his own, of his own generation, and that, that in his own generation... It's not that less is more, it's that more is not enough. You know, so this sense of, 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 of self-centeredness. You know, I love your, your image that 75% of all photographs today are, are of, the, of selfies, you know. So that, that I, th I think that is a real, a real issue. That it, it, I, I found, uh, this is the first time I've taught the course that I have athletes. And athletes get it the communio piece more than anybody else. Because in the, in the rule of Augustine is this critically important sentence. The way you know you're making progress is when you look to the common good before your own. Athletes are right there. You know, that if they are not looking to the good of the team, then, then it's not going to work. And I think that, that this, is, this is really a challenge within the culture. It's within, so, uh, and frankly, I think that, that we, 
work very well here in, in giving uh, an antidote to that culture. That's a, this is a pretty good um, gate to one of the questions that was submitted by our friends in the audience, um, and I'll just read it and, th and throw it to all of you as educators. I have studied our creed through this pilgrim series. I struggle with the lack of faith in many of our young adults uh, in their claim as they hit their 20s that they do not believe, um, despite Catholic upbringing and education, these young adults are choosing to not believe in the creed or a Catholic faith. They feel like the stories in the Bible are made up. The idea of God is created by the human mind, and so on and so on. Do you, um, does this resonate with you? Do you think this is something that maybe most generations have said about their young people, or do we feel like today we are seeing a serious breach between our, between our, our young adults and their Catholic faith that's different or more pronounced? Um, I, I think it's a great question. Um, my sense of it is, I, I see faith as, as learning a way of life. And uh, to me, part of the problem is, I, I think we need to present uh, the Christian faith, the Catholic faith, in a way that says, here's a story that's worth the gift of your life. Um, as, as Andrew mentioned, I think there's a lot of competing narratives in our world today. There's narratives of consumerism. There's uh, narratives of living a distractive life or living an overly busy life. And as, as a result, I think for uh, many young people, the church just becomes one other option. And secondly, I think as more and more people are not raised in any kind of religious tradition, um, sometimes I feel when students come to my class, it's like learning a foreign language. Um, I've, I've talked about the Eucharist, and I had a student one day come up and said, Dr. Waddell, I don't know what you're talking about. And that, uh, that really opened my eyes, you know, that we can assume that people immediately understand the language and the concepts of, of Christianity. So I, I think it's, uh, I think it, we, we need to present the faith in a way that touches the deepest longings of people's lives. And, Ultimately, I think our, de our deepest longing is uh, to know that we're loved, to find something hopeful uh, to live for, and to find a way of life that calls us out of ourselves for the sake of others. And, but in many ways, that's very countercultural. Uh, it's, you know, 75% of our pictures are of ourselves. We live in a culture that basically says it's all about me. Uh, Christianity says, no, it's not. <laughs> it's primarily about God, and it's, it's primarily about other people. And I think, I think people hunger for that. I mean, if it's all about me, that's guaranteeing a pretty lonely, empty life, a pretty desolate life. Um, but I, so I think the challenge is presenting the, uh, the faith in a way that experientially touches where are people today? You know, what are they hungry for? What are they searching for? And then presenting this thing, this is something that can pre respond to the deepest hungers of our hearts. Uh, if you do that, then I think you have people's attention. Well, I'd say that um, as much as they may be unchurched, they're also, I think, very much longing, um, very much wanting to ask these most important spiritual questions about what it means to be human and what it means to be in uh, relationships that are good and that will help them to flourish. Uh, and so sometimes these realities can be just a new entree into helping them think about God. So if, you're, if you ask students about social media and its dominance and, um, and, and use resources like Sherry Turkle from MIT who thinks so much about social media and what it's, what it's making of us, and are we settling for less than we ought to when we're settling for these kind of texts. And, um, and, and it, you can use that to enter into these extremely deep, and I would say theological conversations about what are we settling for less than we should mm -hmm. in our conversations, in our relationships, and then what does it mean to be made in God's image? It means we're made for communion. It means we're made for these 
authentic, loving relationships. And so how, how we use this technology, is it leading us toward those kinds of relationships? Or it, might they be leading us away from those kinds of relationships? So part of it, I think, in the classroom is meeting students where they are. But they want to, when, when you ask those questions, they want to talk about it. They want, they want to be in conversation about those things. And, and what's beautiful, I, I think about, it's a real gift to be teaching at a place like St. Norbert College where we're asked to have those kinds. You know, even the question of contemplation, you talk about that Norbertine value. Where do they get that? If they're, if they're constantly distracted, um, where do, and that, that's part of what it means to live a good and meaningful human life. And we're not just doing that in theology classes and philosophy classes, but, but that, that's a core part of what we think it means to educate the person. Right. Um, and, and what a beautiful gift that we have the opportunity, I think, to do that if they're not doing that in their churches, <laughs> maybe, if they're, if they're disconnected from those conversations otherwise that we have the gift to do that yeah. with them. I, I think part of it also is, is that we have you know, great opportunity. Be, first of all, because that conversation is not only allowed, but encouraged, is where do we find the hook? So um, my course, Communio, is, is, is technically not a theology course. It's, called, it's the, uh, one of the requirements in the core curriculum in Catholic imagination. It's one of the, one of the choices they could make there. And um, so we're... And we start, uh, uh, Dr. Ritter, the, the quote about the Trinity, this, this is where it's at. Because, so we st I start with that Communio is ultimately talking about God. That, that our belief in God is this mutual, equal, um, relation, loving relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I mean, I start there. I show them an icon. I know I can't go very far with that because... I mean, they'll be out the door, all right? But, but I tell them, now this is what, when we look at it from above, but let's start looking at it from below. And I show them the National Geographic uh, DVD on the, the human family, the origin of the human family. Or actually, I start with the Big Bang. So we start with that, that they are seeing that from the beginning, everything in the world is in relationship. Everything is a system. If we believe that has a creator, then that must be the nature of the creator. And, and we go from that, then we go into the Gospel of Luke, Acts, the rule of St. Augustine, the life of St. Norbert, the Norbertine Constitutions, and the back of the bookmark. This is not a theology course, all right? But this is what we're doing. And when, and when we get the evaluation at the end, I, often a student will say, you know, this is a great way to get religion. You know, I mean, it was like, I mean, it's kind of, kind of Coming in, uh, at, coming in at, at not at as, you know, you have to be a, a, a Catholic, but when they start to see what this community is about, what this living in relationship for one another, I mean, that's really the way that, that, that is a contemplative vision, and it really is about the nature of the Trinity. And I, I think that students get that. I, I think another, I, I learned this in being the rector of a, residence hall for three years at Notre Dame. We have to be very, and this is part of my uh, uh, challenge with assessment, especially in this area. We, we cannot be making judgments about students on May 14th when they're coming across and getting their diploma from uh, President Kunkel. I mean, we are planting seeds of, uh, especially students who are just beginning to question. We're leading them into a life of questions that, that go deeper. Uh, thank you all. So one of the things when we when we talk to Dan, which we do several times a year, about planning the forum, one, you know, one of the things that one of the the you know the you know the seminal notions I think that drives him and and comes up all the time I think is his frustration. I hope I'm not misspeaking, um, Dan, but I think Dan gets frustrated because. Um, he feels like the church, um, you know, and he alluded to it a while ago that, um, you know, we, we go to Mass, those of us who go to Mass, and, and the, you know, the, the homilist will get eight or ten minutes a week. But the church generally does not 
do a particularly strong job of explaining, we'll say the creed, and many people know the creed and maybe under, feel like they understand it, but it's kind of a given. And what he has said many times is these are really deep, complicated theological constructs. The Trinity has been mentioned several times. I just wonder if, uh, just to throw it open to you, do you all feel like the church can or should step back and do a little deeper job of, of analyzing, well, where did this come from? And not just that you should believe it, but here's why we believe it. <laughs> that was a yes or no question. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, wow. Um, I... I, I come at it from the point of view of, of preaching. I think that preaching within the context of, of worship, which cannot do theology the way it's done in the classroom and should not. But I think that, that preaching is about meaning. How do these texts, how does this, how does this, yeah, how does this text, how is this autobiographical? How is it, is it a story about now? How does it, change my life. And, and I think that um, I, I, one of the things that I prize most uh, when I preach is when somebody comes out and says, and this happens with, you've really given me something to think about. All right? I mean, it's this to think about and to live into and pray into. I'm not, um, I'm not convinced that, that every Catholic needs to know the, you know, the, the, the theological terminology. I think that 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 they need to to know how 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 does this uh, not not believe me not not that all of us should not be reading and studying. That's why we have some great suggestions for books out there. But that it's this it's the and and I think that that what happens is that uh, preaching is often not connecting with the lives of the people we're preaching to. Right. Say something. <laughs> Great job, Father Andrew. Um, I, I, well, I think that some, frankly, some parishes do better than others with faith formation. I mean, and I think in Catholicism, there was a while where we thought, okay, you kind of get confirmed and then good job. You know, that's all you need to do to think about God or the nature of your faith and that we've, we're, we're moving from that point, I think, and realizing that faith formation ought to be something that happens over your lifetime, that you, that you can't know enough about God. I mean, so if you think about St. Augustine saying, if you think you've understood God, what you've understood isn't God. So that's as much as we can know, right, for sure about God, so... So this sense of, and I, and I think sometimes too, especially people older than I am, we're, we're taught you, it's not appropriate to ask questions. And if you, you know, hear, hear the answers and then kind of be quiet about it. Um, and I think that that's changed too for the better in terms of it's, it's actually good and healthy to ask questions. And, and um, even when we're going through confirmation prep and, and, supposedly becoming adults in our faith, that, that doubts and questions, that's a part of it. That means that we're healthy and thinking um, Christians. And so the, the, the question is kind of how do we provide spaces or resources for people to have, um, have those conversations and to know that's what it means to be responsible for your faith is to keep continuing to, to seek. And, and, and not everybody, I think, has oh here's a you know here's a good book here's Roger Haidt um, why don't you take a look at this right because they don't even maybe know where to begin unless they go to Barnes and Noble and just stand in front of the theology shelf so so the question is how do we create those spaces and resources I think in I think about what's happening at the spirituality center what a great opportunity for people in the community who want to continue to think about these. Um, these questions. I mean, the guy who runs it's kind of a clown, but <laughs> no, Tony's awesome. 
Well, you can be both. He can be kind of a clown and awesome. <laughs> Paul, anything? Um, yeah, just in a way. Neither, neither one of them has hit the right answer yeah, yet. Yeah. So <laughs> the third time's a <the> charm. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, no, I completely agree with with Father Andrew and Bridget said. But it, as they were talking, it, it made me think of of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he's, he's sort of my go-to theologian. But one of the things I love about him, I, his Summa Theologia, which to me is the greatest work of theology, it's fascinating. He wrote this for beginners. Uh, and I think he maybe overestimated <laughs> you know, where the, uh, the typical beginner. But what I love about it, the Summa Theologia is, is Aquinas basically asking questions. Uh, it's, it, the whole thing is just one question after another. And as he asks questions, he engages in conversation with as many thinkers as possible, you know, theologians, uh, philosophers, people from other religious traditions. And it's a genuine conversation because he doesn't, he's not talking to them just to prove that he has the truth and they don't. He looks for whatever is good in what they have to offer, affirms whatever he can, and then he moves on. I mean, he never says that uh, now we've found the an answer, now I've resolved the question. So I think, of, I think of that as a great way of understanding faith, that we can't stand still with where we are. You know, faith either grows or it dies. Um, and in order for faith to grow, it has to be practiced spiritually, but I think also intellectually. You know, God gave us minds in order to understand something. Now, we'll never get to the bottom of it. We never get to the, to the depth of it. But I think of, I think of our faith or I think of theology as an ongoing conversation about something that is truly significant that ought to be joyful. And part of my complaint about faith, uh, the way faith can present it today, there's no joy in it. Uh, I think the Christian life is inherently joyful. Uh, we don't always understand. It's not always easy. Uh, but what we do, what, it's, it's based on grace. Um, so I, but I, I love Aquinas as a kind of way of thinking about the faith. Uh, Aquinas was obviously a genius, uh, but he never thought he had all the answers. Um, and so you just keep probing, you keep, you keep on the journey. Thank you, Paul, thank you all. Um, you know, m many of you in the audience know that before I was in education, I was a journalist, started out as a reporter and then spent much of my time as an editor and manager. And I, when I would work with younger reporters, I constantly you know, talked about context, 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 because you hear about, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why. The hardest is always the why. And sometimes the why is unknowable, but I felt like you're obligated to try to, to get to the why if you can. And one of the things that's, that concerned me, you know, I lived in the Washington area for about a decade before I came here, and I was part of a wonderful parish, but I would get very frustrated because uh, it just felt like the homilists never, there was so much, I mean, this was, you know, roughly, you know, the, the aughts, you know, like, you know, 1998 to, to 2008, and so much going on in the world. And one thing, con think about context, our students have never lived in a world that wasn't, uh, that we weren't at war, that was not governed by terrorism, that there wasn't a pervasive sense of fear and anxiety. It's just hard for those of us that have lived in a world without those pervasive things. And I would hunger as a parishioner for more context. For me, the creed is sort of shorthand for this is, I mean, this is why I'm a Catholic. This is, this is, these are the tenets of what I believe. And so as a Catholic, what, how should I interpret this context in terms of what's going on? And so I would always hunger for more connection about what's, the problems of the real world, and I felt like I seldom got that, and I do feel like I, I, I just wish in general that 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 uh, we would hear more about that. And I think again about the, it's kind of an unfair fight, you know, we might have people for an hour in terms of their active practice of, of a formal practice of faith, and then the rest of the time they're awake, you know, constant bombardment of this notion that you know, more is not, you know, more and more, more is okay, more is good, and it doesn't feel like a fair fight, but I, I, I'd like to see the church put up its dukes a little more about it, you know what I mean? Some of you mentioned your, uh, your, uh, your own 
you know, um, you know formational or influential uh, writers or thinkers, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is who, were, who were some of the key people that shaped your own faith thinking? And then tie that, if you would, to uh, you've each recommended a book, and Andrew, I think you recommended two. Um, can you just say a word about why? Um, do you, if you need to be reminded. But. I think that I, I think there's just one out there that I recommended. Okay. That, that's uh, Lo Fink, a German uh, scripture scholar who's done uh, uh, two books: uh, the um, uh, Jesus, Jesus of Man. Nazareth. Right. right. There's there's a second. Uh, it's in my Kindle. Uh, no irrelevant Jesus, but he is a remarkable scholar who uh, takes his scholarship and then. Uh, applies it to to you know, I don't want to say bite size, but but you know one course of a big meal. So like, what what is the sense of? The, so for example, with the Our Father, that that when we're praying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, we're not praying that as though it has not already happened. We're praying it. it so it's not God make this happen. It is that that it has already happened. We must live into that for it to be fully revealed. So I find him a, a, a very, very um, insightful, in, insightful writer. Writer. Uh, I have to say that that for myself, and I think this shapes. I know it shapes my thinking, but also my preaching. That that um, I find that that um, I I just must read across the spectrum. So, for example, for me, it's always important to have one good novel. So the, the most recent one has got a lot of acclaim is The Underground Railroad, which is, I mean, if you want a, a, an insight into you know, the experience of slavery and being hunted down, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of novel. Or right now, this uh, new book, uh, we're coming out October 31st, uh, 2017, will be the 500th anniversary of the Martin Luther. There's an incredible new biography on him, Martin Luther, Renegade and Prophet. So, I, I mean, it, it reading across a, a spectrum, because again, coming back to the Trinity, everything is connected. Everything is connected. So, that, that is a, that's an important kind of a reading for me. I think, uh, I often try to, to think of that. You know, what, what were, I, the one book I can remember is Man Becoming, uh, back in, when I was a student here. I think one of the most important insights for me it was and is that to, the, to be fully, fully human is to be divine. So that the, this, this splitting off of religion and you know, the, relig the, 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 the spiritual and the religious or the human and the divine is a false dichotomy. So that, and I think that, that's very important in teaching students because that's a, you can begin there in a way that is leading them into the divine. So when I think about thinkers who have shaped my theological perspective the most, I, this might sound cheesy, but I guess I would start with my parents, really. I mean, so the, the fact that I think about my faith as being very practical and a day-to-day, -day, in, in my house we talk very openly about faith and when something was bothering us, we talked about offering it up. And, um, and when somebody that we love was sick, we'd say, well, let's, let's all pray for them. Let's have a prayer list. Let's, so, so it was, yes, we would go to church on Sundays. And for me, I think it was often too, my, my Irish grandpa lived with us. And so this Catholicism is part of my identity. I mean, I, I couldn't not be Catholic, I think, because of just that piece of it. Um, but it also gave me a really, I think what I cherish often the most about Catholicism is it's the, the sacramental worldview. Uh, and that we in, we're encountering God all the time through nature, um, through ritual, through family ritual. Um, and so I, I think that profoundly shaped the way I grew up thinking about my faith. 
Uh, and then I think it was probably when I was at Santa Clara, I started asking more critical questions um, about faith. Uh, and, and so uh, I think people like David Hollenbach, in my, um, who's a Jesuit priest at, he was at Boston College for years, he's now at Georgetown, but he writes a lot about justice and human rights and does a lot of work on refugees. Um, and, and I think for me, a profound book that really shaped my theological thinking was Elizabeth Johnson, She Who Is, which is about thinking about how we name God and, and image God from a feminist perspective. Um, and so, so I think those are a couple key thinkers for me, but also I, th I think about um, writers like Mary Oliver, for example, to me, she's, she's as theological as they get, just and, and with this very sacramental vision. Um, so I love her work, and I find that that's like divine reading for me to, to contemplate. So, so those would be some things. And also I was thinking um, for, for connecting the, our faith to these real world issues that Sometimes it's hard to put that much on priests. I too, but it's like you've got seven minutes and you've got to do, focus on the scriptures and and so where else are we getting it again? So so I was thinking about things like America Magazine, for example, which is so good in terms of thinking about contemporary realities from the light of Catholic faith, and it's written for educated Catholics and um, so those kinds of resources I think are really, really helpful. Thank you. Bridget. Um, well, like Bridget, I would also start with my parents. Um, I came from a big family and so it was kind of hard to avoid the, the Catholic social view of the person. <laughs> there were had five sisters and three other brothers. So, uh, so in a big family, you learn that you live in community. And I think that's such a basic element of our faith that's important because today I think we've lost a sense of that uh, in a very individualistic culture. Um, friendships were always important to me and I, I think of friendships as relationships that shape us morally and, and spiritually. I think they're, I don't think we can, we can live the Christian life without really deep, uh, lasting, good relationships with people. In terms of individuals, I, I mentioned Aquinas. Uh, another one for me was Bernard Herring who was a really well-known Catholic moral theologian both before and after the Second Vatican Council. In fact, he, I know he spoke here at um, St. Norbert in the days when we had the Theological Institute. Uh, Bernard Herring was a redemptorist priest uh, from Germany, but I, I think his real gift was it, Herring always insisted that a good theology is always inherently pastoral. Uh, so that the whole idea of a theology is, is not, uh, especially moral theology, is to help people, to work with people where they are. And Herring said, you know, a, a good moral theology never creates unnecessary burdens. And that deeply impressed me. I thought, you know, that uh, the Christian life should enable us to be humane to one another. It should, uh, should be a way of life uh, that doesn't repress us, but really teaches us what does it mean to live well. Uh, what does it mean to flourish? Um, Stanley Harawas, who was my mentor at Notre Dame, um, Harawas uh, was the son of a Texas bricklayer. He was Methodist. Uh, he's Episcopalian now. But he loved being at Notre Dame because Harawas was convinced his vocation in life was to tell Catholics all the things we're doing wrong. <laughs> and he was really good at it. He, was, uh, he had no shortage of opinions. But he, he challenged me to really think about what we're doing. I, I remember one time I went to one of his talks, and it was on the U.S. Uh, Bishop's 19, it was a 1983 Peace Pastoral, the Challenge of Peace. And Harwas is a pacifist, and one of the people in the audience at the end asked him, said, well, Dr. Harwas, do you believe that the bishops should have pushed Catholics to move more for, away from the just word of pacifism? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, you Catholics go to Mass all the time. What do all those Masses do for you? And I thought, I never thought about that. Uh, so I, but he really, he really forced me to, th to say that you need, a faith has to, 
you have to really think critically about who are you? You know, who are you called to be? Um, finally, Dorothy Day, I mean, she wasn't really, a, I guess, a theologian, but her autobiography, The Long Loneliness, is a book that changed my life um, because her, her whole uh, understanding that faith has to be translated into care for others, uh, especially for the poor. Uh, when I read that book, uh, I, literally, I literally fell in love with her. Uh, who she was and what she was about. So um, those would be some examples. Thanks, everybody. We're going to turn <clears throat> to some questions from the audience. Um, but before, this was actually my favorite submitted question that came in online. Um, so real quickly, uh, if the three of you were stranded on an island on the brink of starvation and forced to decide which person you would eat first, what theological questions or beliefs would guide your decision? <laughs> so, honestly, I, did, I didn't write that question. That, <clears throat> that was submitted by a citizen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um, here's a question. I find my faith changing with age. Please comment. Does faith change throughout our lives, grow, diminish? Talked about it a little bit earlier, but specifically with the notion of just getting older, more experienced, maybe wiser, but maybe more cynical. Yes, it does. Well, first of all, uh, I, I think Richard said it very, very clearly. Uh, it, it must change. It, uh, the, this whole, I think one of the ways that we look at the world today is, uh, is so strongly developmental, from the, first of all, from the point of evolution, but you know, the way we look at the, the uh, you know, the, we know that our bodies change, our minds grow, hopefully we grow psychologically, emotionally, I think one of the challenges is, uh, and that's why you know, it's so wonderful to have an experience like this, is because we'll have people who have grown in all those ways, but they're still thinking about God the way they did when they were confirmed, you know, so that they, they don't continue to grow. So I think that, that yes, our, our faith changes as it could ha be happening unconsciously as our faith is bumping up against the, the context. But I think that, that especially if we are people of prayer and we, we are, uh, there was a course taught in Washington when I was there, it was a homiletics course called uh, The Sunday Gospel in the New York Times. I'm a daily reader of the New York Times. How, how are these two things, what are questions are being raised by this as we, you know, as, as we grow? And, and constantly th those questions must go, they, they must go on until the day we die. I have to say for myself as, as a, a, an older person that, I mean, my whole adult life has been given to, uh, in, in a special way, to the renewal of worship. And I, I have, and, and uh, Erickson says in his models of, of uh, development that, that often what happens when you get to my age is that you, you can become uh, bitter, you know, because the, Maybe you know your projects didn't work. I would I wouldn't say I'm bitter. I would say I think that that a liturgical renewal stagnated. Uh, I think that the for example the latest translation of the Missal was an enormous mistake. I think that people have just kind of settled in, and I think that that uh, that one of the places where where our faith should be growing, and he, this I would take more from the contemplative point of view, and this would be. A particularly Norbertine thing. I think that that for me, one of the places where my faith grows is because I am every day praying the Psalms. And so I, the way I am coming at a Psalm today is much, much different than it was 10 years ago. But I, I think that there is a sense of, of uh, yeah, things uh, are not happening. The When I was a student here, the Second Vatican Council was going on, believe it or not, I thought that by the time I was like 10, 15 years ordained, there would be nothing else to do. I, I mean, it was like all the churches would be united. I mean, it was like, it was, you know, you can only have that thought when you're 20 years old. But, but you know, but, but, but yeah, so, so, but I think that, that on the level of faith, so for example, 
my my sense of the experience of God through prayer uh, is, and that's what grounds me in my disappointment in the things that that have not happened that I would have liked to have seen happen. Uh, so a couple things. First of all, I was thinking as you were talking about a class that I took at Santa Clara called Theology in the Daily News. Mm -hmm. And we would just get together and talk about things that were popping up in the daily news from a theological perspective. Fascinating. Um, but I was also thinking about this, the language of vocation can help us think about how faith changes over the course of our lifetime because God might be calling us in very different ways depending on um, our stage in life and our circumstances, and it's a way to remind ourselves how much um, faith will change and grow as we encounter um, new moments in our life or new relationships or change in job or loss of job or mm -hmm. suffering or whatever it might be. Um, that because we're made for growth and things change, it's inevitable that we're going to be um, continuing to ask questions of faith. And I was also thinking about Paul's comment about the importance of friendship and just how, how crucial I think that is, is to have some key, and maybe we can all think about who those key conversation partners might be for us, um, close friends or family members with whom we can just talk about daily experiences and try to make sense of them theologically. Or I was thinking about, you know, Bell Hooks talking about it. every day I talk to my, my sister and I sit down and we talk about the 10 things that we're grateful for that day. Uh, what a beautiful practice. I mean, we have all these spiritual disciplines in the Catholic tradition we could think about, but just these, these kinds of reminders that what what's happening now how do I pay attention to the now the right what's right in front of me and then think about what that might be calling of me to do or be um, yeah, I, th I think it's a great question I in a way I think as I've gotten older I've been more at peace with things uh, which may seem odd because one thing you noticed of uh, as you, as you get older, you're much more aware of your limitations, of things you can't, the things you can't do. But in a way, I found that to be profoundly freeing, uh, because once I accept I only have so much control about things, I think it's much easier to live at peace. Um, you do get more aware of, I guess, the shortage of time. I tell students I have books on my shelves so I know I never will read. Um, um, but I think it, it frees you up, in a sense, not to worry so much about what are you going to accomplish in your life, but what kind of legacy do you want to, let, do you want to leave? How do you want to be remembered? Or in whatever time you have in your life, uh, how can you use it to do good? So I, I, I think as, as I've gotten older, I've connected faith much more with a sense of gratitude, uh, a sense of you know, to be alive is to be blessed, and to think about all the ways that we're called to, to really cultivate a vision of, of, of gratitude. Then I agree strongly, Bridget, with what you said. Um, I've tried to be more aware of just grace every day, and I just to give a quick example. Every day after class, when I walk from the second floor back to the fourth floor, if you, if you hold, students will hold the door open for you, uh, which <laughs> as you get older is nice. And, uh, <laughs> And most, and I always say thank you, and most of them will say, no problem. Well, the other day, this one guy, I don't know who he was, I'd never seen him before, he said, no worry. And I thought, I've never had anybody respond that way, but I thought, that was a gift, because lately I've kind of been worrying about stuff, I've been anxious about stuff, and that was an unexpected grace. You know, somebody that I never knew said exactly the right thing at the right time. And so I think as you get older, you begin to kind of seize those moments and to be grateful for them. Here's a question uh, from our host. I don't think he'll mind uh, telling us from our, our host, and I want to get this right, Dan. In a, world, in a world full of words, is there wisdom in the phrase, it is folly to be wise? In a world full of words, is there wisdom in the phrase, it is folly to be wise? Did we catch that right?
I was better off. I was 12 years old as far as my faith is concerned, and I hadn't heard so damn many words. <laughs> you know, and I keep hearing and hearing all the time. And I wonder if sometimes we're just better off. It's a conflict I've had for many, many years. And you just, it never stops. There's the words all the time. And it, it's kind of, it's, here we are, we were trying to learn it. So we need words. We need words to communicate. But we're stuck with I think we all resonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any any thoughts on that? Or no. Dan, go ahead, Paul. One real quick and just a few words. Uh, I, I think the ultimately wisdom is found in the witness of our lives. You know that it's not a matter of words, but it's how do we live. And to me, the greatest testimony for believing Christianity is. What kind of people does it produce? You know, what do we see in people who take the gospel to heart? I think that's, I think so wisdom comes from a good life. Someone asks, is our church repressive and should it be? <laughs> no. Church, church uh, not, not college administration. Well, yeah. Church. <laughs> well, uh, that's one of those questions, you know, it would be good to know what, what's under it. Um, no, I don't think the church should be repressive. I, I think that there are. Uh, let me do it from the point of view of liturgy, all right? So that, that um, actually there's a sentence in the, just this morning, I was, I'm, I, this book on Luther is like a novel. I mean, I'm just plowing through it. And this, this big division that came very quickly around the Eucharist, and, and the, the writer is saying that, that Luther rightly believed that the, the Eucharist basically tells us who we are. The Constitutional Liturgy says that. But, but it also tells us, I mean, it tells us who we are in the positive sense, but it also tells us, in the, I believe, that it tells us who we are in what we have not yet achieved. So, so for example, for, for me, the, the, the absence of women and their role in the Eucharist is, is telling me something about a church that, you know, that has not moved, that is still moving, all right? So when we get, so for example, we had about 30 years where the, uh, the lay people could come to the altar at the breaking of the bread and be breaking the bread and, and all that, and all of a sudden, I don't know, about 10, 12 years ago, that was stopped. Now an anthropologist would call that fencing the altar. I mean, so it, it is a clear move that, that somebody thinks that we've gone too far, that, that in other words, that we've got to pull back to this more clerical kind of, uh, kind of vision. I think in that sense, yes, it is, it is repressive. It is repressive. And, and I, I think that, 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 that sometimes that, uh, that it, it is repressive in the sense that we do not allow a question to exist as a question long enough. I mean, it's like we must immediately answer this. And I think in that sense that, that uh, we had a wonderful session in the Night Owl on Thursday, the Donum Ipsum group, David Poister, uh, Professor David Poister and Father Matt Doherty on science and religion. That, that both of them, you know, John Courtney Murray, the Jesuit said, for Catholics, truth is a singular noun. So if science and religion aren't, aren't seeing it as one, they both have to keep on working at it. So yes, I think, I think the church can be repressive. Should it be repressive? No, but I think there are places where somebody said, you know, there is a North Star that we need to be looking at. Um, uh, I'll just throw one more thing out and work with, we have to close in just a few minutes because some folks have to teach. <laughs> Um, we're, we're in Eastertide, we've just celebrated the, you know, uh, remembrance of the singular event in the Christian tradition. I, I would just ask the three of you very quickly, when, when we commemorate Easter <clears throat> each year, what, what does that mean to you? What does that bring back to you in terms of your, your, uh, your faith life? Um, just um, 
it's really the center of our faith. I mean, without Easter, there would be no, there would be no Christianity. There would be no gospel. Um, I think Easter means for me that the tomb is not the place for us. You know, God calls us to life. Uh, Easter is about resurrection, and uh, that's how I understand the, the heart of Christianity, that God calls us to, to fullness of life. And years ago, I heard of a novel named Picnic in Babylon, and there was a line in that novel that says, who have you raised from the dead today? Uh, I think what God did for Jesus, we're called to do for one another and how we relate to one another. So I think Easter is a feast that's called to be our way of life. That's great. Um, and it makes me think about John Sabrino saying that as Christians, we ought to be asking who, who can we take down from the cross? I mean, who are the people who are crucified uh, today? And that, that to me was what Jesus was all about was showing mercy um, and bringing good news, but especially good news for the poor, especially good news for people who are on the margin. So how do we, becoming an Easter people means um, teaching or uh, ministering, showing mercy to those persons most in need in order to make that Easter a reality in their daily life. <laughs> um, so... So, yes, I think the Easter message is a reminder to me that suffering is not the end, but that's not just to make me feel good. That's a call for me to figure out what I'm doing to relieve the suffering of other people around me. I, I think that, that for me, the, 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 the most important recent uh, thing that... Uh, move forward my sense of, of Easter is that whatever we believe about the resurrection is what we believe about where creation is headed. So as a visual thinker, so I mean that the tomb is empty, that it takes place in a garden, that, the, that create, and that's what the, the book of Revelation is about, the, this garden city, you know, where the, the leaves of the trees are good for medicine, the fruit produces uh, 12 months a year, that that this that the whatever we believe about the resurrection is what we are working toward in in in, in our own life. I think the other thing for me has come because I think the big question for me was not a question of disbelief, but was how how is it possible that this is still about a body? All right, and and it was just a big question. But now I, I think that uh, though I am illiterate when it comes to like physics. But I mean the whole sense of the way the way we look at matter and how the, that 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 the evolutionary vision of you know that that in some way consciousness is present from the big bang but has this major breakthrough in homo sapiens that some this this breakthrough in the resurrection is about matter coming into a whole new way of being. And it has happened in Christ. That's we keep on calling him the first fruits. So it gives me a real sense of, of life beyond the grave for myself, for us as a community. But most importantly, that what we are celebrating in the resurrection is this is our vision of where God is bringing us all. Well, thank you, my friends. Would you join me in thanking our three distinguished panelists? <laughs>